probably every engineer out there has built an electric motor project or two as a kid, right? Mine was some kind of setup that included a pop can, some scotch tape, and some wire that may or may not have been temporarily borrowed from some appliance belonging to my parents. You know, there's nothing quite like that thrill you get when you connect up the battery for the first time. Some sparks fly, that motor spins, and... Okay, that's not exactly accurate. It was really like the tenth time that I connected up the battery that that motor actually started spinning. The first time, uh, there were indeed sparks and some smoke, and my mom came running downstairs and, well... Let's just say it takes quite a few weeks of allowance to buy your parents a replacement. Anyway, hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today my guest is David Witt from Infineon, and we're going to talk about brushed DC motor control. Yep, that means we're about to trash your fondest childhood engineering memories with some heavy-duty differential equations. Let's get started. Before we get started, remember to click that link. There you can find out more information about brushed DC motor control from Infineon. Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amelia. So, David, just about every engineer out there has built a brushed electric motor. Some of us with tin cans and wire we scrounged from... um, dubious places, but a lot of us didn't really take the time to look carefully at the physics of the situation. So walk us briefly back through the basic physics of electric motors. We start off with the fundamental law of physics known as Lorenz's force, which helps an electric motor function in an application. With this, you can see how current in a magnetic field can create a force. And then looking at the graph on the right-hand side, you can see how the right-hand rule applies in determining the direction of the current and thus the resulting force that's applied due to Lorenz's law. Okay, force is good, but we need our force to be rotating, spinning, and hopefully throwing off some sparks. Okay, maybe just kidding about that sparks part. Okay, so now that we know how to apply a force, now we factor in the diameter of the rotating coil in this magnetic field, and you can see how this force gets converted into torque. Right. And this torque comes in the form of a sinusoidal waveform. And you can see the equations down here, how torque is equal to the radius times the force. And as the conductor moves through the field, it creates the sinusoidal waveform. Right, torque. Now we're talking. How do we handle torque ripple with a spinning motor? Well, as each coil rotates through the magnetic field, it generates a torque. And you'll see a variations in the waveform, and this results in what we call as torque ripple. Okay. The more coils you add, the smoother the waveform gets. In fact, if you look at the chart above, you can see that if you get three coils in the motor, you can reduce the torque ripple to just 14% of the overall torque. If you increase that number of coils to 11, you can actually reduce that down to as little as 1%. Okay, so how does the commutator come into play here? Well, the commutator is the real reason why brush motors get their name. By using brush contacts, they create the electrical connection to the rotor as it spins in the motor application. Okay, so are there other laws of physics that come into play with brush motor design? Well, that's a good question because we come to our second fundamental law of physics that dictates how a brushed motor works in the application. And that's Faraday's law, which says that a conducting current loop passed through a magnetic field will generate a negative voltage. Okay. This is referred to as back EMF. Back EMF is really just a function of the magnetic field strength and the number of windings along with the speed of the rotation. All those go together to determine the amount of voltage that gets generated in the motor. Okay, so from this perspective, motors and generators are pretty much the same thing, aren't they? Yeah, from a mechanical perspective, they are identical to each other. It just all depends on how you apply voltage or current and what you expect to get out of the motor. In the case of a motor, you're applying a voltage that results in a spinning rotor, which can create a mechanical force or a mechanical torque in the application. If you take the reverse of that, you look at the case of a generator, here, you're using a mechanical force to spin the rotor in the motor, and that spinning rotor can create a voltage, which therefore works as a generator in this application. 
Okay, so we've got our real world motor. Walk me through how our physics lesson from earlier helps us understand how our motor will perform. Really, this has got to break down all these equations and you come to two basic points that are really keys in controlling the aspects of a brushed motor design. The first being that voltage is directly proportional to the speed of the rotor. Okay. It works in both cases in such that the more voltage you apply, the faster it'll spin, or the faster it spins, the more voltage it can generate. Right. Second point to take away is that torque is directly proportional to current. So the more current you pass through the motor, the higher the torque you're going to get out of it, and vice versa. So is there a simplified set of equations that we can use then for real-world motors? Well, to answer that question, I want to refer to the chart that I have on this slide, and that kind of shows you the defining parameters of a motor performance in this application. The real takeaways are the two endpoints of the curve. One, the max torque is generated when there is a stall current, so the maximum amount of current that's being passed through the motor. The second point is the idle speed, which is basically the rotor free spinning with almost no torque being generated and it can be applied to this motor system and that's going to be the fastest that you're going to see the rotor spin in the application. Okay. Now if you take that same graph and apply the power curve to it, you can see that the maximum of power generated by the motor occurs at basically at the midpoint between the idle speed and the stall current conditions. So DC motors can do a lot of different things. Spin, generate, reverse. Uh, walk me through that. What you can see here are the four basic modes of operation, assuming that you have an H-bridge configuration. And that is you have two half bridges that has the ability to drive the motor in either the forward direction or the reverse direction. And now the implementation of both PWMing as well as reverse braking allows you to get into the other two quadrants of operation. Okay. The focus of this is really going to be on four quadrant operation, which is what H bridges are designed to do. But there are also, you can operate in a single ended configuration where you just operate and drive the motor in one direction and one direction only. And you use the other end of the motor connection and apply either ground or power to determine which direction it's going to spin. So what do you mean by operate in a single quadrant? Do you have some examples? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of examples out there in the real world where you only need to spin the motor in one direction and one direction only. Okay. A lot of these applications include like blower motors, fans, many types of pumps, water pumps, fuel pumps, and so on and so forth. So those are all examples of applications where you're just driving the motor in one direction and one direction only. So do you have any examples of four-quadrant motor drive applications as well? Yeah, there are a lot of examples where you may need to spin a motor in one direction and then reverse it back in the other direction. One of the main examples that we use are window lifts where you have to roll it up and roll it down, door latches where you lock and unlock, pretensioners used in seatbelt applications, parking brakes where you engage the brake and disengage the brake, as well as headlamp leveling. So those are all good examples of four-quadrant motor drive applications. So what kind of controller would we need for a four-quadrant motor application? Well, we've developed some very simple solutions that require very few components in order to be able to handle as much as 300 watts in a single application. So the example that I have in front of you right now is one of our Novolithic devices, which we have a couple of parts, which you can use these. These are two individual half-bridge drive ICs. So those along with a simple voltage regulator, microcontroller, and something to protect for reverse polarity gives you a full functioning motor drive circuit for a four quadrant H bridge configuration. You guys have a family of integrated solutions for this, right? Actually, yes, we do. We have two components designed for this. First being the 8962, which has a RDS on path resistance of 14 milliohms and is capable of as high as 42 amps being passed through it. The next level up is the R10 milliohm version, which is capable of as high as 70 amps. Both devices are PWM capable. They have integrated driver ICs built into the device. Very simple to operate in that they have logic level input that can be driven directly from the microcontroller. They all have current limitation built into the device to reduce the power dissipation and provide short circuit protection. 
They also have what we call adjustable slew rates to help you optimize your EMI in the application, as well as the current sense capability where you can actually monitor the amount of current being passed through the motor. They also have over temperature shutdown as well as integrated dead time generation to prevent short through from occurring in the application. So what would you do for a single quadrant situation? Well, if you look back at the previous chart, here we have two of the Novolithic devices right. in an H-bridge configuration to drive the motor. You can just simply eliminate one of those driver ICs, one of the Novolithics, and have the ability to apply either ground or power to the other side of the motor in this application and have the ability to control it and drive the motor in a more of a single-ended operation. Okay, cool. So now what about development or prototyping kits? So what can you do for me there? In this case, we've actually implemented the industry standard Arduino shields for these applications, and we have basically two BTN 8982s, half-bridge Novolithic ICs on the board to give you the full unidirectional brush DC motors, or you can actually do one bidirectional brush DC motor in an H-bridge configuration. This Arduino shield is compatible with the Infineon XMC 1100 boot kit, and this gives you a very easy and low-cost way to evaluate and test your circuits with a motor for your application, and we can provide professional support for the huge Arduino open source community, as well as multiple software examples for the microcontroller and our boot kit utilizing our Dave software tool. Okay, so if I'm on the lower end of the power spectrum, do you have a solution for that type of design? Actually, we do. We have an IC where we've integrated the full H-bridge configuration with a very simplistic control, a very small device if you're very space constrained and don't have a huge amount of power to be dissipated in the IC. This device has over temperature protection, has over current protection, short circuit protection all built into the device to protect the device and the motor in the application. It has the ability to be controlled in two different modes. The first being the simplest where you can actually just have two inputs from the microcontroller, one for the PWM signal being generated, and two, the directional control of the IC. Or you can actually communicate through a SPI interface and control these same parameters. The diagnostics can also be done in two simple ways. First, you can pull the diagnostics of what's going on in the application through the SPI interface. Or you can just do a simple status flag where you can just flag that there may be a problem in your system. Now to give you a little more details on the TLE9201, which was the fully integrated design. And here you have the control logic as well as the power stage all built into a single piece of silicon. We've got a 200 milliohm path resistance in this device that's going all the way from power to ground through the two switches. Okay. It has PWM capable up to 20 kilohertz. We have a chopper mode current limitation as well as a low quiescent current sleep mode capabilities in the device. In the event of a short circuit or an over temperature condition, the device will latch off and require some interaction from the user in order to turn the device back on to help protect the device, the wiring harness, and the motor in the event of a problem that may be experienced. It's in a very small footprint, 7.8 millimeters by 10.3 millimeters. Good thermal performance capabilities and due to the exposed pad slug that's on the underneath side of the IC. This device was originally designed for throttle control applications, but it can handle any motor all the way up to about 6 amps. Okay, let's walk through some of the advantages of these integrated solutions. Now, what do they do for us that we don't get with discrete components? That's a good question, and we'll go into it a little bit more detail when I talk about some of the layout considerations you need to take into mind. What this device does is it shortens the paths between the two switches in the device such that you only have as little as two nanohenries of inductance in the device. This stray inductance is what causes a lot of problems in the applications and leads to high EMI as well as a lot of transients and potential damage to the rest of the circuit. What this integrated solution does is keeps these parasitic inductances low as possible. If you just move these off of the IC and put them on the PC board and connect two discrete MOSFETs in the applications, you can have as much as five times the number of inductance in there. Okay. And all this inductance results in larger transients and less reliability out in the field. Okay, Dave, so where do these stray inductances come from and what kind of problems can this cause? 
That's a good question, Amelia. To answer that question, you got to look at the entire circuit and where all the conduction paths are for the full control of the motor through the two switches, as well as the conduction path through the wiring harness on into the motor windings. All of these are sources of inductance, and with this inductance, you have to be considerate of the DIDT, which is the change in current over time. Rapid DIDTs will result in larger voltage variations at the different spots in the circuit, and if you move on to the next page, you can kind of see some typical examples of these large voltages that get generated due to the large inductance is associated with the motor drive circuit. And in the next slide, you could kind of see the red voltages are all voltages with respect to the ground circuit, and the black letter or black voltages are those with respect to each other. So you, you can see some rather large voltages being generated due to switching noises and stray inductances, and this can result in over and under voltage conditions, EMC noise, and thus can require some additional filtering or some higher component costs. So the key to operating in these applications is to keep the stray inductances as small as possible. In the next couple of slides, I can kind of give you a few hints on how you can actually accomplish this in your design. Excellent. So Dave, what can be done to avoid stray inductivities? Well, the first thing you can do is keep all the components in this conduction path as close together as possible. So you want your high side and low side MOSFET as close. You want the DC link capacitor, and that'll be an electrolytic in combination with a ceramic capacitor in parallel with it. And then also, if you're using a current shunt, you want to keep that as close to the driver IC as possible as well. Another thing that you need to do is to avoid thin connections. Okay. Parallel wires have lower inductance than a single wire. So these are ways that you can kind of alleviate some of these conditions. And if possible, we want to optimize each half bridge for itself, and that's keeping high side and low side DC link capacitor all close as possible. And then finally, if you can have one cap per half bridge, it will also help to eliminate some of the noise that gets generated. So what about our power and ground planes? That is another great way to help alleviate some of the stray inductances, and that's by creating bulk capacitances between the power and ground planes. And the use of power and ground planes in this way helps alleviate some of the issues seen due to stray inductances and resistances. Okay. So what the planes do is they can add small bits of capacitance overall through the entire assembly through the PC board, utilizing the power and ground planes, keeping large planes in parallel with each other in the assembly of the PC board. Okay, Dave, this was a lot to take in. Can you summarize some of this for me? In motor drive applications, you're going to want to stay away from these seven deadly stins as well as accommodate some of the hints that I'd given you before. First, placing the MOSFETs far away from each other is definitely going to cause you problems in the application. The use of high ESR and high ESL electrolytic capacitors is also going to create problems. Forgetting to place the ceramic caps in parallel with the electrolytics can also cause problems. Placing these caps far away from the MOSFETs is going to increase the amount of stray inductance that you're going to see in the application. The use of thin connections is not a good practice, as well as forgetting that the shunt is part of the critical path. And optimizing the wrong paths, battery or the motor connection, can also create some problems in the application. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Dave. Well, thank you so much for having me, Amelia. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out more information about brushed DC motor control from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal, or check out the on-demand section of eejournal.com. <laughs>